What I was asked to do is to uh, to talk about Desiree Daganville, and Desiree Daganville was a French author. Um, uh, at the in, well, he started writing in the early 18th century, um, but he wrote about the practice of gardening uh, of the of Le Notre of the period from 1650 to about uh, 1709 when he published his book. Um, and this book was entitled uh, La Théorie et la, la pratique, pratique du jardinage. The, uh, the uh, um, history and practice of, uh, of, um, of, of planting. I'll come back to that. And um, I was asked to talk about the groves included in that. Uh, one of the um, uh, things that I've been doing, uh, I did a master's thesis many years ago on groves um, and um, uh, have continued uh, bits of research on that. And uh, that's what I'm hoping to convey today. Um, so the, um, ah, this is interesting. Yeah. So the, uh, the theory and practice of gardening as it was translated in English in 1712 uh, contained these engravings of uh, gardens, of typical French gardens, which um, uh, afterwards uh, were shown not to be at all by Desiree Dangerville, but uh, by someone called Leblanc. That doesn't really matter, but um, uh, the translation by which it is known uh, in English is John James. And that's the one we see here on the left-hand side and a uh, picture of the book on the right-hand side with my dirty thumb at the bottom. Um, so Desiree Dagenville distinguished a number of different types of groves. So uh, the first one of these was the great wood of forest trees pierced with double stars or a single star. So star woods, as they were referred to, were a popular device of the uh, um, 17th, late 17th and early 18th century. And uh, this was at a tremendous scale. Um, so here we see um, two of the sort of fictional layouts that include all the elements that you might find in a, a, a typical layout. The areas in between the, uh, the, uh, the walks, but these are all the walks, growing right across, the areas within uh, are referred to as the quarters or the squares, even when they're not square, the quarters or squares. And it was the way these were infilled that made a difference to the aesthetic appearance of these places. So uh, we've got um, here uh, great woods of tall trees, which were all um, uh, in different forms and shapes, um, different types of layouts, um, but all with similar planting. So the, the trick about these was that they were intended, these trees were intended to grow tall, uh, mainly for wood production. They were widely spaced and they had sparse undergrowth, um, really benefiting the, the trees. Um, the walks were uh, normally without hedges, but they could also be with hedges. Um, so uh, uniform plantations. As, as they were intended. This was quite a favorite type. And um, in, in many countries, there started to be publications on planting in England. Uh, it was John Evelyn Silva here on the left hand side that proposed this type of planting um, and uh, was first published in 1662. And um, the picture here is from the 17th. 34 edition, which shows uh, a forest, uh, planted forest or wood or large grove, as it is also referred to, and um, just north of Leeds. Uh, and on the right hand side was Moses Cook. Moses Cook was a gardener and he helped to uh, to promote this in, in this book, The Manner of Raising, oops, The Manner of Raising, uh, Ordering and Improving Forest Trees and uh, uh, forest and fruit trees. 
So um, uh, this was a, a common type, which was extended over time to something called forest gardening by Stephen Switzer. Um, and uh, uh, Stephen Switzer um, uh, was uh, the main landscape designer of the sort of the, the next generation. Um, and he saw that all of the landscape was a garden. And um, here is a sort of a fictional layout of Paston Manor, as it is called, um, uh, sort of a defense type layout uh, with these walks here. And this was referred to as forest gardening. So different ideas as to what forest gardening was supposed to be like. Well, the second type was nearer to the house. Um, it was so-called open groves. And these were trees generally uh, planted at very close distances, no undergrowth, uh, with tufted crowns. Um, and tufted crowns means that they were pruned up very high so that the crowns split, not a single leader. Um, and the, the, there were no hedges and the grass was generally covered. The ground was generally covered with grass, but it could also be soil a surface. Um, and um, later on, um, Betty Langley promoted it as um, a mixed range of trees uh, with flowers around the base of the trees and climbers up the trees. So um, close uh, spacings, uh, 16 uh, to 18 feet, uh, so that is uh, uh, about up to about five meters. Um, and th this can be seen in all the examples of the late 17th century. And here you see different types. Uh, here you see an orchard planted like this. And this here is, uh, th these here are the groves. Here another orchard. Uh, this is from John Reed, the Scots gardener, uh, an example. And th these trees could be planted in, in squares uh, here on the left. Yeah, and that is the manner in which they were arranged in the ground. So uh, the squares or in quincunx, like the five of a dice. Yeah, or they, they might be uh, irregular. And here's the an irregular example, uh, a gr uh, an open grove uh, at Hartwell Manor uh, in, uh, in Oxfordshire. Um, which, uh, which shows the trees not in lines uh, and, and uh, as irregular as possible. So um, these are sort of the, the various types. Um, within that, uh, they might, there might be holes, so-called holes, oh, um, and uh, open spaces um, with, uh, with, with, with trees continuing uh, throughout. Um, and here you see different types in which the, uh, the, these groves might be arranged. And these groves themselves might also be referred to as quincunks. So it becomes quite confusing with these words migrating, these terms migrating from, from the manner of planting to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the spaces and to the whole of the layout. Uh, André Mollet, um, provided uh, important examples. And um, uh, I've so drawn one from a description here where we know a little bit more. This was at Wimbledon, which he designed in the uh, 1640s, uh, <clears throat> 1642. And uh, here we see uh, sort of a reconstruction of that type of planting with hedges uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, beach. Uh, in the middle, uh, an elm uh, or lime tree, uh, and the centers very densely planted. And densely planted means very close together, so that you couldn't walk in between. That type of planting can be seen in many places, and it can also be seen that the, the, the reference to uh, being surrounded by very high hedges, uh, as, as this example at Herrenhausen, where you see that the trees become part of that the, the hedges, yeah, and so they talk about hedges of thirty and fifty feet high, so that it is uh, thirty is nine meters to fifty to this fifteen meters high. Um, it's uh, yeah, 
were qu quite an organization to to uh, to maintain that. Here there were two different heights. You had the the hedges around the edge immediately, and then within that you did the dense planting with uh, undergrowth and trees. Um, London and Weiss um, uh, also sort of uh, uh, they were the main landscape designers here in England in the late 17th and early 18th century. They were the ones with the large nursery in Brompton, and they provided this example here as, uh, yeah, uh, and they refer to a thicket of trees resembling a copse. So, so densely planted that it re uh, rep uh, uh, looked like a coppice wood. So that also gives some indication. It wasn't didn't really matter what was planted within them. It had to be dense. Um, and sometimes they said evergreens instead of hedges around the edge. Yeah, so uh, uh, always hedged quarters. And it's depicted like this. Um, and that doesn't really represent what it looked like. Uh, and that's also quite interesting. Um, then the other sort of uh, schematic, well, the other types of wilderness, the wildernesses of fruit trees. Again, this was not necessarily referred to by Desaillers. Dagenville, uh, but there were he, uh, there were examples given in uh, his volume um, at Versailles, which were here in front of the uh, the, the the berceau, the bower, um, with uh, sort of trees planted. These were fruit trees, and that was a, a general part, also part of the ornamental uh, layout. Fruit, uh, apple trees were becoming fashionable um, uh, on dwarf stock during the 17th century. And uh, that became quite sort of uh, an art to, uh, to plant those within the garden. <clears throat> so another uh, type of example was given uh, the wilderness uh, of evergreens. Uh, so, um, and this was, uh, uh, it's a beautiful poem of Castle Howard where this, this whole area here was an evergreen grove, um, and where the it it didn't uh, uh, well. The poem says, "Beyond it circles a pleasant grove raised from the family of constant love. No boisterous storms, nor inclement sky, which tender leaves and springing birds destroy, affect the somber shade you here enjoy. Perpetual verdure." All the trees disclosed, which, like true love, no change of season knows, i.e. it's always green, always beautiful, it's always lovely. And um, several examples uh, exist to that on paper. Um, in particular, these are Tillington in the Netherlands, it's Nimmerdor. Uh, and um, here's a sort of a drawn out, you can see sort of a, a wood of Scotch firs, uh, uh, Pythea. Uh, uh, Pinus sylvestris, a walk of uh, firs, uh, and that is probably a Pisea uh, abius, and uh, <clears throat> and a covered walk in the center with yew trees. So uh, very evergreen, dark and, and gloomy, but always alive, always fresh. That was the thinking. Um, so the next type of grove is grove opened in compartments uh, with areas within either with grass squares or kept as uh, um, uh, uh, flowering meads or uh, sometimes uh, ornamented with flowering shrubs. Uh, oops. Um, low hedges over uh, over which you would be able to appreciate what was happening within and uh, small trees not tall forest trees an example was given by the, by Desiree Dagenville as such you can see the grass areas here and these grass areas weren't necessarily mown areas they were uh, sort of enameled uh, ornamented with flowers so uh, yeah and and no trees in the middle of the, of the squares, yeah, so it is all around the edges, uh, the hedges, uh, sort of all planted within the hedges, and uh, yeah, sort of the shrubs within that, uh, in, in at various spacings. So what we see anew here is the sort of uh, 
uh, appreciation that sh uh, shrubs might be able to contribute substantially to the appearance. But how do you maintain that? And uh, another type that is, is, is given uh, by Desiree Daganville is uh, the copse. Uh, in England, uh, that was referred to as a spring wood, trees springing up. And here you see sort of a, a coppice um, uh, being maintained in Oranje Wout in the Netherlands. Uh, from this, uh, and this has been coppice since the 17th century. Uh, it has rather gone in the last sort of uh, 30 years. Has, it hasn't been coppiced again. This is an old photograph. Um, so here we've got the various types. Um, so forests of great woods of tall trees, coppice woods, yeah, groves of a middle height with tall palisades, uh, sometimes woods of evergreens similarly planted, uh, woods uh, opened in compartments. We've seen that and groves in quincos. But Desiree Dagaville didn't see everything. Uh, and in England, at the time of the introduction of the French formal garden, uh, generated a real interest in the classical, in the Italian nate. And uh, various examples were sort of considered. And here you see sort of uh, a type of bosquet uh, that you might have found in uh, Renaissance reconstructions of these gardens. But uh, not being satisfied with that, uh, uh, Lord Burlington commissioned Robert Castell to uh, write uh, a book called Villas of the Ancient Illustrated, in which uh, he con contained a number of reconstructions of these classical groves, as they understood from the text uh, here at the bottom right-hand side, the villa here, of course, and these are the, the orchards and the, uh, the hippodrome. Um, but this is the, the wilderness, which is uh, directly associated with that layout. You can see the taller trees, but you can also see this sort of dense area uh, and look at these serpentine walks. Well, these were replicated at a place like Chiswick, and it was one of the first to have this, um, where uh, Robert Castell's drawings, uh, layouts was emulated in sort of a similar layout. Yeah, you see these curved layouts. Uh, you see the old house, the later, the, the classical uh, pavilion, and this classical sort of layout with axes still, and, <clears throat> and these serpentine walks. So really emulating what, uh, how the classical garden was understood. Um, and that is also represented in these sketches by William Kent. Um, and it uh, can be seen uh, in various engravings of the place where you can really see sort of the, the dense uh, planting and layout of these groves of middle height, as Desiree Dagenville referred to. Uh, and that was reconstructed sort of in the uh, uh, late, no, 1990s, early 1990s. Um, and uh, an, an historic engraving which shows it as it was being planted up in the at the first. Yeah, sort of these, uh, these hedges planted, and within that, these trees with underplanting, which you see here. So these places were used for uh, uh, entertainment, for walking, and for all kinds of other purposes that might desire seclusion. But not all the different types that were available at the time were included. And one which comes through in the English literature is a, a, a sort of a, a much more mixed and varied growth uh, with open spaces within it. And it was Francis Bacon's uh, notion of the ideal garden, as he expressed it in his writing in 1625, that sort of gives a, a view of, of, of this, which was emulated by uh, John Norse, uh, in Campania Felix uh, in 17, uh, 1700, which uh, generated a mixed planting of deciduous and evergreens, beech hedges and green walks. Yeah, so, and these green walks would be, um, uh, and there would be little hillocks, uh, which you see here in, on a French engraving with, uh, with, with thyme, violets and primroses. So this was uh, sort of more the type of planting you might understand from this. And you might imagine that a horticulturist like John Evelyn, the famous horticulturist who wrote so much, uh, that he, his garden would contain this. But that was also, again, a typical uh, wilderness with 
uh, very dense planting, but it had these spider claws, as he called them, a mount in the center. Uh, and uh, you see the typical sort of star-like layout. Uh, St. George's Cross, they like to call it in England, with uh, 40 cabinets of Alaternus. Alaternus is Ramnus Alaternus, French, French walnuts, yeah, and, and, and then 500 standard oaks. So here the planting was incredibly thick, um, uh, sort of a, a, a three foot apart. And then uh, within that, a thicket of birch, uh, hazel, thorn, wild fruit and greens, evergreens. So again, very dense planting. And that is represented here in this, uh, this layout. And this led um, to something else. And that was an appreciation of the notion of these, uh, these um, uh, shrubs as used. And here, um, planted by Queen Anne in, or in 1602 by London and Wise, in fact, but for Queen Anne, uh, is a, sort of a planted mound, a mound shaped, uh, by by the by the by cutting the shrubs, um, and which was which later became sort of the bosquet à l'angoise on the continent or the shrubbery in England. And these would be would consist of uh, uh, layers of shrubs, shorter, middle, and higher, and then at the back, tall trees, um, and this would be sort of in the shape of a mound. So that is. And it was referred to as graduated planting. And we can see that on historic engravings, such as this one of Stephen Switzer at Grimthorpe. And we can see that on the continent where it was taken uh, for the Jardin à l'Angoise. And particularly, it has been continued here uh, in, in France in the royal uh, parks. Uh, and, and you can see that it is quite different from the, the traditional wilderness. Much of it, um, you know, wilderness has sometimes survived, but very few, in fact, have. And uh, it is at Hampton Court that I want to finish um, with a picture of what this wilderness looks like today after uh, three centuries, three and a half centuries of management of, uh, of, um, of my gardens for not the wilderness itself, but uh, this is now the wild garden and the naturalization of, uh, of bulbs within it um, and the, uh, the structure of the old wilderness has uh, sort of gradually eroded out. But it's still there, sort of, if you can read it. Thank you very much. I hope this has given you a little bit of a background as to the different types of planting and that Desaliers Dardenville didn't see everything. He did come to England, but um, he didn't report on the, the, the novelties which he saw here. He applied his French uh, ideas onto the English garden. Thank you very much.